as I mentioned uh, before uh, uh, the 11 o'clock hour rolled around that uh, today's presentation, we thought we'd give uh, Skip a little bit of a break. And uh, I already had an idea. It was timely with this week. And uh, um, this is, as I mentioned, was going to be kind of like a prequel to uh, the presentation I gave a few weeks ago on uh, We Were Once a Christian Nation, which was kind of a an historical um, retrospective on God's role in our nation's founding. And this this kind of falls right into that. So it may seem like familiar territory. Um, so this week, uh, some of us, or actually probably most of us, I know uh, either Thursday or yesterday, and Skip mentioned yesterday, had a good one, and some are doing it today and some tomorrow. Uh, most of us have uh, gathered together to share a big meal with family and friends in the American tradition of Thanksgiving which for several decades uh, has fallen rapidly out of favor with the ruling class. In the larger population, Thanksgiving has gone from a commemoration of giving God thanks for our national blessings and our individual blessings, uh, you know, together as a nation, uh, to becoming the starting gun to the Christmas shopping season with the inauguration of Black Friday. And that ended up kind of becoming its own holiday weekend and of more importance in the culture than being with family to give thanks. So much more uh, important in the last 15 years or so that uh, Black Friday actually started on Thanksgiving Day itself. And uh, it was marked by mob insanity not seen since starving Ethiopians were overrunning UN food trucks, which is kind of nutty. Uh, more recently, however, uh, Thanksgiving has become synonymous with food, football, and oppression. It's an all-out assault that it had begun in our traditions and our foundations, declaring them to be unforgivable sins, an institutional evil which they demand needs to be purged and replaced. And the genesis for this message is this week alone, major news outlets are running stories about the calls to abolish Thanksgiving and declaring it a day of mourning, as, fa as Fox News reported here. And I'm quoting from this article, the recent national shift from Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day reflects a changing national mood. And we ask if Americans should do the same with Thanksgiving. Starting in 1970, many Americans led by Indigenous protesters believe that Thanksgiving should be rededicated as a national day of mourning to reflect the centuries-long displacement and genocide of Native Americans, unquote. The article goes on to cite many universities across the country who worked to successfully get Columbus Day scrapped and renamed. Now they plan to do the same thing with Thanksgiving. And one such organization, uh, given a big boost in this effort, with federal tax dollars that you and I uh, help contribute to, is this bunch here that I, I didn't know about till this week. A group called Truthsgiving, and I'm quoting from their website here, quote, Thanksgiving perpetuates white supremacy and romanticized notions about indigenous peoples. To celebrate the current Thanksgiving mythology is to celebrate the theft of land through ethnic cleansing and enslavement. It is a lie that overlooks the genocide of Native American indigenous peoples and the enslavement of African American indigenous peoples in order for settler vigilantes and colonial militias to steal land and labor, the legacy of which is still felt today, unquote. Uh, and this, you know, not to be outdone, MSNBC decided to take it up a notch, uh, you know, uh, not to let the Native Americans be the only claimants of oppression, M MSNBC. CNN and other Marxist propaganda outlets with BLM leaders declared across the airwaves that Thanksgiving is all about white people perpetrating genocide and violence against blacks. Who knew that the white supremacist, racist, Christian pilgrim invaders slaughtered all those indigenous black Americans that once lived in Cape Cod in the early 1600s, right? I mean, who knew? I guess that's my white supremacy that's kept me blind and ignorant to the fact that I've been helping kill millions of black Americans by gathering with my family and giving thanks to God on this day. 
sorry for the sarcasm, but it's the only way I can kind of address some of this insanity that's out there. And so this is what our rulers and their media propagandists are preaching in a never-ending loop. You know, horror follows a constant drumbeat of pronounced societal zeitgeists such as this. History teaches that once a pluralism of belief is reached among a population, that those who represent or defend those histories that are being erased are ultimately erased themselves. You know, people who are ignorant of their foundational history, willful or not, there are people ripe for conquest, if not eradication altogether. Now, I imagine that most of us on this meeting today, the most of us are over 50. And amongst us is a repository of knowledge and understanding of our actual history that sadly is really not, not taught much, uh, much anymore. So I thought it might be somewhat therapeutic for us as American Christians to refresh ourselves on the true history of Thanksgiving and its role in our national character, and to discuss the attitude of thankfulness that scripture makes plain. It's a tenet of our faith as disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh, I suppose that most of us were taught that the pilgrims came to America. Oh, by the way, as I get into this, again, like with every, anything else that I do, uh, I am fine with anybody just butting on in and having a comment or a question um, at any time. Um, again, I, I can't see the chats uh, and I can't see the microphones, all of them, because I'm in full screen mode. So just speak up, pipe up, uh, Skip can kind of monitor things for me at, the, at your end. That'd be great. I um, appreciate that. So again, um, I suppose that most of us here, at least I know I was, we're, we were taught that the pilgrims came to America to escape religious persecution for religious liberty. Uh, that's not entirely or exactly true. While indeed the Puritans had endured persecution in England, having been arrested often by the soldiers of King James and imprisoned and beaten by sheriffs because they refused to acknowledge his ecumenical authority, they ended up actually fleeing to Holland and they settled in this town of Leiden there. Uh, and there they enjoyed religious freedom in what was Europe's most, quote, tolerant nation for religious dissenters and religious people for 12 years. Holland was largely a secular culture. It had no direct allegiances to the popes in either Rome or England. So that was the, the, the area that people could go and still practice their religion. However, as I mentioned in my We Were Once a Christian Nation study a few weeks ago, the more secular culture of Holland was drawing their children from the faith and corrupting them. See, to the pilgrims, it was not fear of persecution that drove them to seek a new place to call home. It was fear of seduction. And because of that, it became increasingly clear to them that God was calling them to leave Holland and go to the wilderness that was America. I mean, if their motivation had been only about having religious liberty, they could have stayed where they were. They already had it. They, they had no threat to their community there from the leaders and the rulers of Holland. They were largely left alone. However, they understood that they were called to be missionaries, and that was not something that was tolerated in Holland. The belief was, believe and practice what you will, but do not convert others. And adding to that, the corrupting influence of the secular adult culture kind of made them realize that establishing a Christian culture and a British culture that uh, amidst the leavening of men really wasn't possible where they were. So it wasn't technically persecution directly that they were fleeing from. They were fleeing seduction for the sake of their faith and their children's faith. And they were running towards holiness that they saw as the call of Christ on their lives in order to build a church in the wilderness outside of corrupting influences of his existing monarchy, papal hierarchy, or pagan secularism. Again, this all came about because the Bible was printed and they could read it for themselves. These Puritans believed that going to the new world to, for the express purpose to plant the gospel of Jesus Christ in the wilderness would be a supreme calling for their faith. 
future, their future governor, William Bradford, wrote the following. And again, these are for Bradford's diaries. He wrote, they had a great hope and inward zeal of laying some good foundation for the propagating and advancing the gospel of the kingdom of Christ in those remote parts of the world. Yea, though they should be even as stepping stones unto others for the performing of so great a work. What was special about the pilgrims is that these English evangelical Christian exiles, what they were doing was actually laying uh, the moral, spiritual, and governmental foundations of America there at Plymouth Colony. But it was only by God's repeated intervention that they survived to actually accomplish that calling. Leaving Leiden in midsummer, they traveled in barges to Delft Haven and they boarded the small ship Speedwell for the short trip to Southampton, England. And there they met the Mayflower, the larger merchant vessel that they leased for the occasion. And they also joined up with additional English passengers whom these saints dubbed the Strangers. And these were people that were mainly adventurers, fortune seekers that were gonna to go to the new world to find gold or to trap for fur and so forth. Now they had a lot of delays. They were they, both of these ships were, were to set sail for the New World, but the Speedwell kept developing leaks, and they had to return to port and get it fixed and set out, and the leak would continue. I think that happened three separate times. So, being so the, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, the uh, the Mayflower and the Speedwell were were British ships and not not Dutch ships, or no, they were British ships. Okay. The Speedwell was the passenger ship, and the Mayflower was the cargo ship, and they were both under the the British flag. Um, so, but they they left they, they left on barges from Holland to Southampton, England, where they met up with. Uh, uh, well, actually, they left on barges from Leiden to the main port, and then they sailed on the Speedwell to meet up with with the, the Mayflower. Um, and but they had delays because the Speedwell kept taking on water. And uh, eventually, uh, they couldn't wait any longer, so they told everybody to get out of the Speedwell because they had to abandon her there at port in uh, Southampton. And that crowded everybody onto the Mayflower, all 102 passengers uh, and crew. Well, there were more crews, 102 passengers, and 40 of those were the pilgrims from Leiden in Holland. And they were led by their governor, William Bradford. Now, the ship's captain, Master Jones, continually noted to, the, to this group that the Mayflower was a cargo ship. It was not a passenger vessel. He was worried about how so great a host was going to endure uh, the uh, four and a half, five weeks it would take to cross the Atlantic. But they ended up setting sail anyway. It was early September, and they set sail for the New World. And as the last glimpses of their ancestral homeland faded from view, Mayflower launched out into the vast North Atlantic Ocean, and uh, but they were blessed when they left because the first few weeks at sea proved to be real balmy, balmy calm uh, sailing weather for them. But then, as often happens when the people of God are tested, the voyage turned nasty. Their delays had put them squarely into the fall storm season, and the old freighter soon found herself battered by fierce gales and towering waves of sea green water and foam. The crew ended up tying themselves with ropes to the masts and the rigging to stay on board, the tossing ship. Their captain, Master Jones, then ordered below uh, and into the ship the 102 men, women, and children passengers. And they were confined to what was known as the tween decks, the cargo area of the old ship, which was about 90 feet long, 25 feet wide, and it only had about five and a half feet of headroom. And in these storms with people being simultaneously thrown from side to side, it violently pitched up and down in the waves. There were children crying, adults throwing up. Uh, imagine it would just been awful, the stench of vomit or animals, unwashed bodies, uh, seawater pouring through the deck above. The conditions must have been nearly unbearable for them. But the passengers tried to cope with their fears as best they could, and they would do so by chanting the Psalms from the Bible out loud. And because of the, 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 the fierce storms, that actually welded saints and strangers alike into literally a single-frame congregation of desperate pilgrims. 
and they really did have good cause to be afraid. In the midst of one terrible storm, there was a sudden loud crack, and one of the large beams that held the mainmast in place snapped, and now was dangerously sagging. And if that beam gave way, the mast would fall off the ship, and the ship would probably founder, probably with the loss of all passengers and crew. But by the grace of God, the pilgrims had brought with them a large iron screw, uh, which I'm assuming was going to be used to dig uh, wells for fresh water. And that was uh, brought up on deck and quickly hoisted into place under the beam to hold it up. And the ship's carpenter, uh, young John Eldon, uh, rigged it together and the beam thankfully held. Um, in the midst of another storm that took place right after that one, uh, John Howland, who was a young 20-something indentured servant of the Pilgrim's first governor, John Carver, John Carver found himself unable to take the confinement, and he went up on deck. And as soon as he stepped out on deck, uh, a large wave washed into the ship and took him overboard. And Howland found himself in the icy waters of the North Atlantic. And uh, if you saw the movie Titanic, you know, hypothermia is minutes away in uh, really cold water. And as a lot, uh, the large waves buried him time and time again, his strength began to rain out. And as he says, he went under for the last time. One of the trailing ropes from the Mayflower's rigging happened to snake across his wrist. And instinctively, he said his hand closed on it. And he ended up becoming, I guess what you'd call a surfboard, being pulled atop the waves behind the Mayflower. And the crew managed to haul him back on board with the help of a boat hook. And God's hand was had intervened here directly. And everybody, even the strangers, recognized and noticed this. John Helen wrote about it. And he ended up becoming one of the leading elders of the Plymouth Colony. He ended up having ten, ten children. As a matter of fact, uh, the former President Bushes are direct descendants of John Holland. So after, Hi, Michael. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm I'm quite sure I'm mixing up uh, a couple of stories, but Arthur has spoken uh, about the Geneva Bible and how uh, the, they fled from England to to Switzerland, and uh, there they translated a Bible, and I, I can't remember. Ar and so I want to kind of ask this question to Arthur. Arthur is. Is the Geneva Bible involved in any of the, the stuff Michael's talking about, about coming over? Was that the Bible that they brought over, um, you know, and so forth? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, 1599 was the date that the Geneva Bible was published. Um, I'd like to go back a little bit in history, very, very, very briefly here, because um, this all be started with Henry VIII and divorcing England and marriage and so forth. And he was a, a 15th century period. And following Henry's um, reign, he rejected Catholicism and brought in what we call um, the Anglican Church. Uh, following Henry's death, Bloody Mary, his daughter, took over. She reigned for six years. Um, both Henry and Mary slaughtered a lot of people who were good Christians. This was part of the migration to Europe. Um, and uh, she died after six years on the throne. She tried to take the church back to Catholicism and therefore banned uh, the other uh, Bible uh, that was being produced, like the Geneva Bible. And then finally, Queen Elizabeth I, she, wrote, she ruled for a very, very long time. She was much more tolerant she never married and she didn't put many people to death but she did put quite a few to death so the people from geneva uh, was a mixture of people no doubt and uh, as michael has been pointed out and they were at sea for 66 days which is a very very long time to go without water so i agree with michael's theme here it was a real miracle the fact that they got there and this young man was saved his life was saved yeah, thanks, Arthur. Yeah, I, I believe you're correct. I think that was the Geneva Bible they had because the King James Version of Scriptures uh, came out and it was published in 1611. And this was a voyage that took place in 1620. And I don't think they had mass publishing houses uh, with, you know, the kind of printing presses that we have today. They can churn out 100 copies of, of, of a book a day. Um, and so... Um, 
I imagine, given the date that, that Arthur gives, that uh, of the, the scriptures that they had, and again, John Brantford uh, uh, had the big, huge, a lot of his pictures are he's depicted carrying this monstrously huge Bible everywhere he went. And it was, I, I would guess, because I can't, I don't know off the top of my head, I don't ever remember reading anything specifically of whether or not it was the King James Bible or uh, or the Geneva Bible, but I'm going to go with, I think it was probably the Geneva Scriptures. that they Mr. Google, Mr. Google says it's the Geneva Bible. Okay, that would make sense. Uh, just due to the, just again, due to the fact of how the printing presses worked back in those days, uh, it was still a relatively new technology that existed. And I imagine that even though you can make multiple copies, it wasn't anything where you could, you know, uh, spit out uh, books in record time like we, we have it today, or even uh, at some can, can I also mention the mentality that uh, extreme control was exercised by the royalty and upper classes and most people in England couldn't speak French or Latin which is what the upper classes spoke and the common language of England was looked down on for common people and there was a great deal of discrimination taking place so there were lots of reasons why people wanted to leave and uh, clearly uh, they were willing to sacrifice everything to do so. I think it's a very good analogy for us today. Uh, we're willing to make a sacrifice such as this. Right, exactly. One thing to keep in mind that would make me inclined to agree with Google, Mr. Google, as, as Mark pointed out, is again, these were people that were persecuted by King James. As a matter of fact, they refer to him as their dread sovereign. Uh, these people still consider themselves British, British subjects but they knew that King James was a tyrant. But these were already religious separatists uh, at the time, going back to the late 1500s, that when they had the scriptures, they were reading it themselves, decide, uh, didn't decide, but they saw that the, 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 the corporate church in England and in Rome was corrupt. And they wanted to return to a more pure form of religion, of the Christian faith, which was laid out in the pages of scriptures that was back in those days, you know, the, the Geneva Bible. So I, I would imagine just guessing that if King James came up with his own translation, given the fact they're being persecuted by King James because they did not recognize his ecumenical authority, that that's not a translation they were gonna, like going to want to get their hands on, especially if they considered uh, the church at, at, at England to be corrupt, which they did, which is the reason they, they were persecuted and they, they fled to Holland. And the reason they were called Puritans is because they was teased that they thought themselves more pure than the bishops and the clergy of Great Britain. And that's where, again, Puritan was a slang term. It was a, it was a derogatory. It wasn't a term of endearment. Um, it was a, it was like the word Christian. It was, it was a derogatory. Um, but as, as uh, Art mentioned, you know, they, they endured storms at sea for, uh, it was a 66-day voyage, which took longer than normal because they got caught in storm after storm. And they were in these storms for 44 out of their 66 days at sea. And the weekend at sick passengers at last sighted land on November 9th, 1620. However, they were blown 200 miles off course. The land that they were seeing was Cape Cod. So the ship turned south towards the original destination in the northern part of the Virginia colony, but the ship soon got caught on the shoals off the bottom elbow of the Cape. And after fighting through that for over a day and getting nowhere, the Pilgrim leadership prayed about it and decided God wanted them to stay right where they were and start a separate colony rather than the one in northern Virginia. So Master Jones sailed back north a bit and anchored the Mayflower in the lee curl of Cape Cod's tip in what is today is Provincetown Harbor. And there they uh, reassembled the uh, one-masted sailboat that they brought in uh, pieces on the ship. And they uh, prayerfully launched a hand-picked crew to sail around the uh, inside perimeter of Cape Cod Bay search for the right location for their colony. But soon after they launched and just out of sight of the Mayflower, the skiff was overtaken in a blinding snowstorm and they were blown into Plymouth Harbor. 
And after spending a cold and miserable night on a very small island, they rested the next day on the Sabbath. That's what's written in their journal. And they ended up, um, then after the storm subsided the following day, they came ashore at Plymouth uh, and were glad to be, you know, out of, out of the water and not stuck on an island. And um, they ended up uh, leaving the, the, the sea and they came upon, not far from the seashore, uh, what was an abandoned Indian village. Uh, the ground was cleared and recently cultivated. The wigwams were empty, but inside each were stores of dried corn. But there were no Indians anywhere to be seen. There was an argument over how to pay the owners for the corn, but they soon discovered that the human remains and bones that the landing party uh, found, they assumed they were inhabitants of the village, and they were. So concluding that God had prepared this place for the colony, they sailed back across the bay back to fetch the Mayflower. And after anchoring the ship in Plymouth Harbor, they commuted from the ship to shore in the ship's skiff. And there they began construction on a common house in the remains of the Indian village. And there they, uh, they could sleep and store more supplies until they were able to start building their individual houses. However, being the uh, dead of winter and doing a lot of outdoor work in the, in the cold to secure the camp colony with immune systems that were already weakened by the rough voyage, they began to get sick. Colds became bronchitis and pneumonia set in. The dreaded killer of ship passengers, scurvy, and other wasting sicknesses ravaged their number. With no effective medicines, they all began to die. In January and February, the deaths sometimes reached two and three a day, 17 dying in February alone. At one point, there were only five people in the entire company well enough to be on their feet to care for the rest who were not sick. And towards the end of March, when the worst was over, they had lost 47, nearly half their total number. Okay. Now, wait a minute. Didn't you say early on that there were 40 pilgrims? Yes. That took the voyage. Yes. So if, if they lost 46, their uh, no. the numbers don't, John. There were 102 passengers total. There were 40 pilgrims, but the other people that were with them were not, they were not Puritan pilgrims. They were adventurers trying to make a fortune in the new world. There were 102, they called them the strangers, but they kind of became a single congregation during their voyage. There were 102 passengers. Of those okay. two, they lost 47, nearly half their total number. Of the 18 wives who had gone on the voyage, 13 of them had died. Only three families remained unbroken, and they were in real trouble because the food they brought on the Mayflower was also gone, and they would end up uh, down to uh, only five kernels of stored Indian corn per person per day. I mean, I don't know about you, but imagine living on five kernels of corn a day, but they did. That's, that's what got them through. So on March 16th, 1621, while they were building their homes, a lone English, uh, a lone Indian clad in only a loincloth suddenly appeared and greeted them with the welcome Englishman. And after the pilgrims had recovered from this total surprise, they found out that this Indian's name was Samoset. And then he had come down from Massasoit, the region, regional Indian chief who lived about 40 miles to their southwest. And the following week, uh, uh, he appeared again. Uh, this time he brought with him a Patuxet Indian by the name of Squanto, who, as William Bradford would write, was a special instrument sent of God for their good beyond their expectation. Squanto, it turns out, could not only speak perfect English, he understood English customs, but he was also a Christian. What are the odds of that? So Squanto literally offered them uh, his services to help them uh, survive, and they were invaluable. Here hey, he Michael? Yeah. So where did he learn what he learned? I'm about to tell you. Oh. <laughs> I'm about to tell you. This is the way God works. We'll recognize God's hand in, in this whole situation. And it, it's not a happy story either. Um, but he ended up teaching them uh, how to fish, 
what uh, plants and berries were edible, which ones were poisonous, what herbs were good for medicine, and how to trap beaver, which would later become a source of income for the pilgrims. Most important of all, however, he taught them how to plant corn and how to plant it and grow it the Indian way by burying dead fish with the seed to fertilize the seedlings as they grew. And he was God's special instrument uh, for their physical salvation. Here's the history. Uh, the pilgrims learned that Squanto's tribe, the Patuxets, had lived there in that abandoned Indian village at Plymouth. But in 1617, a plague, which was likely brought by French fur trappers from the north, had killed every member of the tribe, probably smallpox. And this is why they found the ground covered with human bones and evidence of previous cultivation. The plague raced through their tribe so fast that they didn't even, did not even have time to bury their dead. And Squanto, he escaped the plague because he was not there. See, Squanto had been kidnapped in 1605 by an English fishing expedition, and he was taken to England, where he lived for nine years in the home of a merchant named John Slaney as a slave. He learned to speak English and became accustomed to English ways. In 1614, he was taken with 20 other Patuxet Braves and seven Nosset Indians, seven Nosset Indians to Malaga, Spain to be sold into slavery. Now, when it became Squano's turn to be sold, monks from a nearby monastery took pity on him, bought him, and took him to their monastery. So Squano ended up living with these Spanish monks for about a year, after which he converted to Christianity and then he obtained his freedom and he ended up working his way through Spain and France until he could cross the English Channel and get back to England. And while he was in England, he stayed there until 1619, when he finally returned to America on a fishing expedition to the New England coast. And he did so in exchange for his services as a pilot in American waters so they could fish it. Captain Dermer of the ship dropped him off at the tip of Cape Cod. But when Squano got back to his village there at Plymouth, all of his people were dead, killed by the plague that had struck two years earlier. So he was heartbroken, and he wandered among the ruins and the bones, and then he walked 40 miles southwest to the tribal seat of the uh, Wampanoag uh, and Chief Massasoit, who took him in. And he stayed with them until March of 1621, when Samoset had returned from his village site to tell him that some English had settled where Squano's village was. Squano suddenly felt he had a new purpose. He would go help these white people as an act of mercy to show Christian charity to both pilgrim and Indian alike. So that's the history of Squano there. Oh, what an incredible story. Yeah, that's the way God works. Isn't it amazing? Okay. True history is amazing. I don't know why Hollywood always has to embell embellish history because there's no need to. True history is, is even more fascinating than uh, having to uh, uh, milk it in Hollywood. Um, Indeed. So in um, mid-October of 1621, when the 20 acres of corn the pilgrims had planted under Squano's tutelage had been harvested, the pilgrims wanted to hold a celebration of Thanksgiving for God's blessing. And so they invited Massasoit and the Wampanoag and, of course, Samoset and Squano as well to come and celebrate with them. Now, Massasoit, he came a day early with 90 braves, plus women and children. And there was a lot of fear at first because so great a number of guests meant that the pilgrims were going to have to use most of the corn stored up, stored up for the winter to feed everyone. But Massasoit had brought with them five freshly hunted deer strung up on poles a lot of wild turkeys. There was fish from the bay, berries and other fruits, roasted corn, and the pilgrim women supplied vegetables from their gardens. Now, legend says the feast began with the serving of, um, of five kernels of corn on each plate. And this is their preparations for their first Thanksgiving. And legend says, again, I, it's hard to tell. There's a brief mention, but that's that may have been a tradition that every meal, but uh, they started with the, the five kernels of, of corn on their plate so they would not forget their divine deliverance. And the feast lasted the better part of seven days. 
Three full days and nights at the beginning with their Indian guests, complete with bow and arrow and musket shooting contests, foot races and relay races, and it was a good and peaceful times for white Indians together. See, they didn't have the NFL back then, so they had to do the sports themselves uh, while they were while they were together. Now, uh, this is from the journal of the plantation at Plymouth, and this is what Edward Winslow wrote. It's always good to kind of revisit history in their own hand. He wrote, Our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on fowling. You know, that's bird hunting. So that we might, after a special manner, rejoice after we had gathered the fruit of our labors. They four in one day killed as much as, with a little help aside, served the company almost a week. At which time, amongst other recreations, we exercised our arms many of the Indians coming amongst us, and among the rest, their greatest king, Massasoit, with some 90 men, whom for three days we entertained and feasted. And they went out and killed five deer, which they brought to the plantation and bestowed on our governor and upon the captain and others. And although it not always so plentiful as it was at this time with us, yet by the goodness of God, we are so far from want. Now, it's been suggested by some, I've read it and I've heard it spoken, that these first Thanksgivings were during the Feast of Tabernacles, or at least inspired by them. And I kind of concur with that thought a little bit, considering the fact that these pilgrims were a biblically literate people that strove to follow holiness as rigidly as they believed that they should live. He writes, our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on fowling so that we might, after a special manner, rejoice together after we had gathered the fruit of our labors. Um, I don't know why, but when I read that, this verse automatically comes into my mind, which is uh, found in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 13 through 15. You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days when you've gathered in your harvest and you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant and the Levite, the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates. Seven days you shall keep a sacred feast of the Lord your God in the place which the Lord chooses, because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands so that you surely rejoice. I just, I, I find the the fact that on their minds, they actually kind of wrote in, in a biblical poetry type of way. And I don't know if that's just because they were constantly reading the word of God and their speech flowed forth from that. But I, I kind of uh, noticed uh, that that kind of rhyming in, in my mind. And I could be historically inaccurate to that, but I like to look on it that these were biblically literate people and that to maybe in their minds, even though they may not have named tabernacles as a day that we're, we're observing and keeping, that they recognize that uh, that there's goodness in actually keeping these days. And they may have been as a result of, of, of fall harvest festivals um, that were found in Scripture. They may have recognized that the Hebrews did it and they thought they would emulate that a little bit. Uh, just my own speculation on that, but kind of makes uh, sense to me. And regardless of whether or not Sukkot had any influence, this feast of theirs was in thanksgiving to Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for his miraculous provisions of Squanto, the education they received from him, the survival through the harsh winter, and the bounty of the harvest. Now, they had another Thanksgiving held in 1623 after the original equal share charter was abolished by their governor. See, the original charter mandated equity of shares to all of age in the colony, both for repayment of their debt for their voyage and whatever profit they had. This was America's first experiment with collectivism or communism, as Bradford called it. And it was not working in spectacular fashion. This is what uh, Bradford wrote. I, I don't know if you guys know about this, but you might find it interesting. He writes, the vanity of that conceit of Plato's and other ancients applauded by some of later times, that the taking away of property and bringing in community into a commonwealth would make them happy and flourishing, 
as if they were wiser than God. For this community, so far as it was, was found to breed much confusion and discontent and retard much employment that would have been to their benefit and comfort. So here's what happened in 1622, bred contempt and disrespect when those who were unable through age or bodily strength got the same exact share as those who were abler and were able to work harder. The fruits of all labor were collected and redistributed in equal share. As a result, the harvest of 1622 proved a disaster, and they nearly starved to death again with barely enough to keep any of them alive through that winter. Because those that were able were like, why should I work so hard so I could feed everybody else? And so they didn't. And so the shelves went bare. So they wisely decided socialism would be their death. Even though it sounded good to begin with, reality kicked in hard and they tossed that chart out and drew up a new one. One that literally became the engine that made prosperity possible. He writes this again. This is Bradford writing about what they ended up having to do. He so, and, and this is biblical, and so assigned to every family a parcel of land according to the proportion of their number. For that end, only for present use, but made no provision for inheritance, and ranged all boys and youth under some family. They, they, you know, people that didn't have kids, they had other sons assigned to help other families. And this had very good success, for it made all hands very industrious. So as much more corn was planted than otherwise would have been by any means the governor or any other could use, it saved him a great deal of trouble and gave far better con uh, content. The women now went willingly into the field and took the little ones with them to set corn, which before would allege weakness and inability, whom they have compelled would have been thought great tyranny and oppression. So what you have here is the establishment of private property rights. Those came into being as a result of, 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 the, of, of, of what happened with collectivism, and each family was responsible for themselves. So the following summer of 1623, they ended up also having a prolonged drought, which threatened famine on the entire land. But after open fasting and prayer for weeks, it rained. To the shock of the Indians, William Bradford wrote the following. This would come up. It says, it came without either wind or thunder or any violence, and by degrees in abundance, as ye earth was thoroughly wet and soaked therewith, which did so apparently revive and quicken ye decayed corn and other fruits as was wonderful to see, and made ye Indians astonished to behold. And afterwards the Lord sent them such seasonable showers with interchange of fair warm weather as, through his blessing, caused a fruitful and liberal harvest to their no small comfort and rejoicing. So this was cause for another Thanksgiving that fall of 1623. And the pilgrim practice of designating an official time of Thanksgiving spread in the neighboring colonies and became an annual tradition. And just as those neighboring colonies followed the pilgrim's example of calling for days of Thanksgiving, so too did they adopt their practice of calling for times of prayer and fasting. And that went all the way up into uh, uh, the, the colonies, uh, all the way up into a revolution. And calls for pr days of prayers and fasting were very common in those days. And it became very common also that in the fall, they would have these annual calls for Thanksgiving and prayer when the harvest uh, was called in. So, so the Thanksgiving celebration so common throughout New England they didn't really begin to spread southward until the American Revolution, when Congress issued eight separate national Thanksgiving proclamations. Congress also issued seven separate proclamations for times of fasting and prayer during the Revolution, for a total of 15 official prayer proclamations during the American Revolution. Here's a proclamation of 1780. This is from John Hancock. 
Uh, he wrote, I do therefore by and with the advice of counsel recommend to the good people of this commonwealth to set apart Thursday, the 7th day of December next, the day recommended by the Congress of the States to be observed as a day of public thanksgiving and prayer, that all the people may assemble on that day to celebrate the praises of our divine benefactor, to confess our unworthiness of the least of his favors, and to offer our fervent supplications to the God of all grace, that it may please him to pardon our heinous transgressions and to incline our hearts for the future to keep his laws, to comfort and relieve our brethren who are in any ways afflicted or distressed, to smile upon our husbandry and trade, to direct our public councils and to lead our forces by land and sea to victory, to take our illustrious ally under his speedy, under his, wait a minute, I got lost here, under his special protection and favor our joint councils and exertions for the establishment of speedy and permanent peace, to cherish all schools and seminaries of education, and to cause the knowledge of Christianity to spread over all the earth. Given at this council chamber in Boston, the eighth day of November, in the year of our Lord, 1780, and in the fifth year of the independence of the United States of America, signed by John Hancock. Again, you read all these proclamations, and they, they sound very, very similar. And they have the same uh, beats. It's about giving thanks, asking for forgiveness for our transgressions and our sins, bless our ability to serve and help one another in, in every industry and trade, and uh, that we we beseeching God for, for his blessing on these things. But giving God thanks first, asking for forgiveness second, and uh, then asking for the blessings after that. America's... My hope. Yeah. A couple of things jump out as one is his comment to keep all his laws, which I thought was interesting. The other was where he says uh, for the establishment of speedy and permanent peace. Now, was he looking forward or or was he looking backward when he said uh, for the establishment of speedy and permanent peace? They were in the middle. They, of, they were right in the middle of the Revolutionary War at that time. You know, the, okay. I mean, the 1775, you know, was the first shot heard around the world. And the war went until 1789 at the battle. Okay, yeah. So they were. Yeah, I, I guess I missed the dates. Yep. Yeah, this You're, is 1780. Yep. So this is in the middle of a conflict. Um, and they knew God's hand was involved and they were asking for his help. And they, again, declaring a day of Thanksgiving <clears throat> in the midst of war. Um, and so that was, a, a, I thought that's another thing that is kind of amazing. Um, that in the midst of war where you're begging God for help. And the first thing, again, they do give God thanks and ask him to forgive us our sins. Um, and that's something that, uh, I, I, that, that biblical poetry that follows with, uh, you know, how, how Jesus Christ gave us that blueprint and how we should pray to the father. And that's how these proclamations, they all read very, very similar. Uh, uh, throughout uh, history there. So America's first national Thanksgiving. Now, these are all individual colonies that did these proclamations or the Continental Congress, it would issue them. But America's first national Thanksgiving occurred in 1789 with the commencement of the federal government. According to the congressional record for September 25th of that year, the first act after the framers completed the framing of the Bill of Rights was this, and I'm quoting, they could not think of letting the session pass without offering an opportunity to all the citizens of the United States of joining with one voice in returning to Almighty God their sincere thanks for the many blessings he has poured down upon them. With this view, therefore, they would move the following res resolution. I don't know if I can't remember if I printed this or not. Yes. Resolved that a joint committee of both houses be directed to wait upon the President of the United States to request that he would recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer. And of course, George Washington, knowing the devout man that he was, instantly seized upon that request 
and issued uh, his first Thanksgiving proclamation, which was published in the papers. There's a copy of it, and he wrote. He, he basically repeated the uh, the um, uh, what Congress wrote verbatim, but he added, "Where are he is, it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and to humbly to implore His protection and favor." Now, therefore, I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November, 1789, that we may all unite to render unto him our sincere and humble thanks for his kind care and his protection. Now, that same year, the Protestant Episcopal Church, of which President Washington was a member, announced that the first Thursday in November would become its regular day for an annual Thanksgiving. Quote, unless another day be appointed by the civil authorities. So this is where the annual Thanksgiving uh, uh, tradition kind of really got its start. Um, following President uh, Washington's initial proclamation, national Thanksgiving proclamations occurred only sporadically. There was another one by President Washington in 1795. There was one by John Adams in 1798 and again in 1799. One by James Madison in 1814 and again in 1815. Most proclamations, however, were at the state level. And it was not until the Civil War in 1863 that uh, Abraham Lincoln set aside the last Thursday in November as an annual day of Thanksgiving, which had been followed through as an American tradition and holiday. And this came right after the Battle of Gettysburg. It's kind of sad that it's become a tradition that reminds everyone to be grateful for the stuff that they have, but it doesn't spend as much time focusing on giving thanks to God for his provisions, his blessings, uh, the liberty and the freedom to follow God and worship him uh, as he leads us and to be able to do so uh, in peace. It's a sad thing. You know, sadly, much of our youth, they have cursory knowledge of what I've covered, and if they were exposed to it, once they get to college, they're likely and willfully and vociferously going to reject this out of hand for the anti-colonial zeitgeist that everyone is now being indoctrinated with. And, and it's no wonder that this stuff's happened, that we're watching. It's kind of escalating. You know, I've kind of really took notice of it this week that it's just becoming absurd. But when I think back and I thought back and meditated on my own life, it, it's really no surprise that we've arrived at this particular point. You know, during my tenure as the last year of the baby boomer generation, Thanksgiving become Turkey Day, where family, football, and Christmas lists, they kind of became the focus. God was largely a footnote, a tradition mentioned at Grace before digging in. I mean, outside of my grandparents, I think my folks stopped going to church on Thanksgiving long before I was even in grade school. I remember my grandparents saying that, you know, you should go to church on Thanksgiving. Uh, but by the time I was a kid, my parents, they weren't going to church on Thanksgiving anymore. I mean, for me, growing up in the late 60s and 70s, I mean, we watched, uh, you know, uh, uh, all the stuff on TV, you know, a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving. Um, you know, we, we made toilet paper turkeys and Indians. It's grade school. Uh, we saw the Macy's Parade on TV. But even 50 years ago, in all honesty, my siblings and I thought Thanksgiving is merely the starting gate to the week's long buildup to Christmas. And so did my parents. And of course, their behavior mirrored that fact. I mean, we never ever heard, I mean, when I was growing up, about how upset Native Americans were over the Thanksgiving holidays back in those days. I think the closest that we ever got was this guy on TV in the early 1970s and that campaign to stop littering. You remember this guy? Yep. Uh, yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't until I got well into high school that social studies units were devoted to talking about the plight of Native Americans. And that's the first time I ever heard of the idea that they were exterminated so that we could just take their land. You know, well, thankfully, my enjoyment of learning about history did not lead to the kind of teaching that I was given just sit and fester in my mind. Yeah, sure, our founding uh, had com complexities to it and difficulties. And it's really only a confounding issue if you think like Esau. You know, bringing God and biblical history into the equation, along with reading the writings of those 
that lived that history and that chapter in history uh, provide wisdom and knowledge uh, a whole, that a whole lot of my graduating class probably never heard of. I mean, and it's sad because by the time my graduating class had kids, once their kids came home with school assignments in the 1990s and 2000s, all they understood was how awful the pilgrims were. And the culture began preaching the same thing, that you know, that seed planted in high school easily germinated into accepting uh, that as a truth by the evils of whiteness. But it doesn't really stop there because the ultimate goal, brethren, is this. Our demonic culture demands this people cease to give thanks to God and rather loathe, dismantle, and discard those institutions and give thanks only to government as a great provider and equity maker. And I think that this verse fits where our culture has gone. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened, which is Romans 1.21. Look at this culture, and I think that right there is an indictment of everything that we see going on around us. Michael? Yeah. It's <clears throat> interesting that you bring up Romans one twenty one. I had printed out Romans chapter 1. Uh, I, let me run through, if you don't mind, and yeah. hit some of the high points here. Yeah. <clears throat> Verse 18 of, of chapter 1 of Romans. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them for God made it evident to them and then in verse 21 for even though they knew God they did not honor him as God or give thanks but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. And then in verse 25, for they exchanged, the, and boy, have we not seen this, for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. You know, we have a, a national day of, of uh, worshiping the earth, don't we? Yes. Sir. Um, you know, for that reason, God gave them over to degrading passions for their women. And, and, and anyway, it goes into homosexuality. It's most I, I, I thought, you know, Paul, was seeing the same things back then that we're seeing now uh, was a disintegration of the thankfulness that we should have for all of the things that God has given us. You know, when when God told Paul, no, I'm not going to fix your problem, whatever it was, I think it was eyes, but that's beside the point. I'm not going to fix, my grace is sufficient. And, and Mark has done a great job over the years talking about uh, grace. Uh, yes, it's unmerited pardon, but it's so much greater than that. It's the creation. It's the plan of God. It's 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 giving his his son to us. It's allowing his son to come down and, and die and shed his blood and cover everything. You know, that's what God's grace is, and and so much more than that. But anyway, I just thought Romans one was kind of an interesting uh, uh, thing to go along with what you were talking about. Yeah, thanks, Skip. I appreciate that very much. It just adds a little bit more weight. Again, I'm almost to Skip's more of a history lesson than a actual line by line a, a Bible study like you do. So it's always good. And rather than me throwing scripture after scripture to kind of proof text a point. Um, I thought it would kind of be interesting, especially with this group, to kind of have a, a, a kind of a philosophical discussion, a theological discussion about um, why is it uh, important? Why is it vital for us as Christians to give thanks? I mean, that's something I was thinking about. I mean, what what, what does it do to a person that that's thankful uh, as opposed to a person that is unthankful? Uh, Michael, I want to I'll answer that, but I want to uh, give thanks to you for putting all this together. It's obviously very well thought out and very well 
done and put a lot of work into it, and I really do appreciate it. You're welcome. I'm a bit of a student of, of history, and I did learn a few things that I didn't know, and I think it's fascinating, fascinating how the, the important part is that they fled to another country to escape persecution on, the, on a religious standpoint. But they had the freedom there in that other country, but they saw how they were being corrupted. So they left to come to America. And I see a lot of similarities between them and the Exodus. Yes. Um, they, it's they, so fascinating. It's just like the Exodus redo, you know? Yeah, they, they did too. As a matter of fact, uh, when the Mayflower set sail, one of the pastors, John Cotton, gave a benediction and he read out of the Old Testament. And proclaimed to the the, uh, the Puritans that they were going to be establishing a church in the wilderness, and they were going to be spiritual Israelites, and that was something that stuck in all their minds. You read the diary writings of, of these governors, and the term spiritual Israelites or references to the Israelites uh, comes up quite a bit in their writings. So yes, yeah, yeah, and absolutely. And it, it's, why is it vital to give thanks? I mean, I'm reading reading Proverbs again, and it is the it is the it's like the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Being humble is the beginning of humility. And uh, that if you can't see where your blessings come from, then you're 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 doomed to be overwhelmed by your own humanness and think that you did these things. I'm great. I look what I've accomplished. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thanks. Excellent. Anyone else? And discussing the whole concept of, of giving thanks and being thankful, why it's so vital for us as Christians to always maintain yeah, it. it. It takes our minds off of ourselves and helps us to understand that uh, we are not the center of the universe and that we need to... Um, understand our own our own earthiness um so it's all tied in with acknowledging god i that's that's the way i would would see it yeah i would agree again i don't think there's any wrong answer i mean uh you know in terms of why thanksgiving is so important uh to have as a mindset among christians i mean it, for me it was kind of a, a stickler thing my grand my grandfather kind of drilled the idea of being humble and, and thankful all the time because he, his, his uh, uh, experience with the Great Depression kind of really, he would always tell me stories about how hard things were and that he would always tell me, you know, what you have may be gone tomorrow. You need to give thanks while it's here, um, you know, kind of out of a hidden fear that, you know, that you, you're not going to appreciate what you have until it's gone. So give God thanks while it's here and while it's available and while God is listening. And that always left an impression on my mind because as I got older and I looked at history and I saw what things were like back in the uh, uh, you know 30s and what it was like to live during the Great Depression with no income and, and things were very very difficult, kind of made me appreciate you know kind of the kooky things that the rest of my family would make fun of my uh, my grandfather for. I mean he never wasted anything, you know he would like I used to kind of joke that he would gift wrap the garbage. I mean, he would reuse and reuse tin foil and rubber bands and everything would, would be stored and, and reused because he always had this, I think, this fear that these blessings wouldn't always be here the way they have them currently. So. Whoa, 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 whoa. Now you're stepping on Jill's toes. Uh-oh. I don't mean to do ever that. Si ever since I've, we've been married, she has the, been the master of coming up with little ways to use bits and pieces or to build things that she doesn't have the perfect tool for she washes her plastic our plastic bag storage bags always has it's been a never ending uh thing with our children because um they don't see the point but i see the point she this woman has saved our family tens and tens of thousands of dollars by her her frugality and her respect for the the things that that she has um uh, that we've been given as a family so you talk about using bits and pieces of of stuff she cleans uh foil wrap 
and reuses it if it's possible. Um, and there's a lot of things I'm sure I'm forgetting. Yeah, no, thanks for that. I, I actually believe that, that that's a form of Thanksgiving, that you're not taking what you have for granted, that, you know, we're going to use this until we can't use it anymore, you know, so we're not, you know, because we're honestly, we're, we're what do they call us, a, 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 a throwaway society? You know, the moment it's not working or, you know, we use it once, you, you throw it out and chuck it and you get a new one. You just go out to the store and buy a new one. Right, Jill? I was just going to say, um, you're touching on the right point there in that, you know, sometimes the kids would say to me, um, just buy another one. We can afford it, you know. And and I had to explain that the point, it, it isn't a point always, a point of frugality. It's the throwaway wastefulness that the land, you know, I mean, I don't want to sound like a progressive greenie, but, you know, just filling up landfills unnecessarily, throwing things away that is just, it, it's the wastefulness, I think, um, that bothers me as much as anything, you know, because it is tied in with the gratitude for what you've been given and the respect for it. And um, and so it's not always, you know, about saving dollars. It, it's just there is an attitude that, I, that has always, you know, been hard for me to deal with is just seeing the wastefulness, um, you know, <laughs> just watching people unwrap gifts and just rip up the the paper and the wrapping and, you know, the, uh, those kind of things when it's just something that if, that you could use again, you know, and it just, so, yeah, I don't know. We're not all born that way, but, um, but the other thing going back to why we should give thanks, you know, one of the first things you teach your kids um, is that concept of please and thank you. And, you know, and it, it, bothers me to see that my some of my grandkids have have not been taught the same you know that principle of saying please and then saying thank you um is a scriptural principle because god says ask and it shall be given to you you know and the in the asking there is an acknowledgement and a recognition that there is something that you want or need or would like that requires, as someone else just mentioned, the humility to ask somebody else to give you that. And, and then the expression of thanks when you receive it, even if it's just pass the, please pass the butter down the table, you know, and then being willing to say thank you. There's, there's just something about that whole little verbal process that connects you with one another that you you know you just you recognize that you need one another and it translates into onto a spiritual level if you can never go to god and ask him for something and or can never go and thank him for things um then the relationship breaks down because you don't realize you, you begin to forget um how connected you need to be to one another in order to supply one another's needs not that god needs us you know but you understand what i mean with that yes. that's all yeah you mentioned of, of of gifts you know it's kind of frustrating watching everybody rip into then you know um i think second timothy three talks about a, a culture of people that are unthankful and unholy and that's where lawlessness kind of kind of grows um you know and uh, you, I, I tend to think that you know, being thankful is also, you know, showing appreciation. And, you know, if you're given a gift from someone to be appreciative of it is obviously, you know, we want to give thanks. And how often do we know, my own kids are guilty of this, that when they receive a gift, if it's something that they don't like, you know, they're like, did you put the receipt in the bag with it so I could take it back and get what I want? Rather than appreciating the thought that went into giving it, everyone's always looking at the object. Is it what I want, you know, and I can exchange it for what I want rather than, uh, you know, receiving the gift with, with, with Thanksgiving, um, you know, that this person was thinking of you and, and wanted to provide it for you. And I think that's something else that's kind of got lost 
it's been that way since I, I was a kid also. Yeah, Arthur, go ahead. I see your mic's on. Well, I'm, I'm sort of in the same era as Jill, a little bit older. I was born in 41. And went through World War II as my first memories. And my father was in the army, came home um, um, in many ways in very bad shape. But we cannot appreciate if we grow up in wealth, we cannot appreciate not having wealth. So when you have poverty or you're poor and you have to work, and I know Jill's background and uh, knew her mother, and so forth in Australia, uh, but when you, when you have to actually go out there and deliver newspapers or clip hedges for people or carry people shopping or mow the lawn, which is the background I'm sure Jules had and I've had, uh, then, then you can appreciate the wealth and abundance uh, uh, that uh, is around you. If you never have that, then it's an impossible mentality and attitude for you to have. So Thanksgiving today cannot really represent the Thanksgiving back in the uh, 1600s there, or the 1500s, when, when the founding fathers came to this country any more than people in World War I or World War II, my era when I grew up, can appreciate the sacrifice my grandparents went through in England with this terrible class structure. Uh, and, um, you know, if you weren't born into a higher rank, you were nothing but the working class. And you had three classes on the rain, on the railroad, the first class, second class, and third class. And then you had, uh, people who were uh, really the first class and they were separate and everything was distinction uh, so in America is a wonderful wonderful place in so many ways but we've lost the groundwork and the, uh, in so many cases of what allows us to be thankful yeah thanks Art. I, I, I agree with with a lot of that you know you were talking about the things that we take for granted I kind of thought it tied in a little bit about why a persecuted church grows and those that are prosperous with a lot of wealth tend to shrink. I think that same dichotomy works with um, with, with churches that, that have gone through persecution and hard times are the ones that tend to be healthier and are growing and the ones that are uh, fat and happy are the ones that tend to uh, fall by the wayside. Uh, and become complacent and don't do the Great Commission uh, as they used to. And, you know, it, you don't enjoy liberty until it's not there anymore and it's gone. But The, uh, the first line of uh, Psalm uh, uh, 111, uh, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart and the company of the upright uh, in, the, in the congregation. And, and maybe that's... Uh, you know, something that we should do more, you know, I mean, it's telling us what, uh, what we should be doing. Yeah, exactly. I've, I've got, I don't have 111. Uh, thanks for bringing that one up. Um, but a few, since Rod, Rod kind of, uh, did a nice segue, um, you know, giving thanks for our national blessing reminds us where our blessings come from, as, as was mentioned. I, and, be, and as Rod just said, because it's important. Uh, Psalm 95, uh, verse 2, let us come to him with thanksgiving and let us sing psalms of praise to him. I mean, I think something happens to us when we're consciously giving thanks to him who provides everything for us. Um, because I think maybe it has something to do with then we become, uh, you know, pride, uh, prideful. We become proud. We say, oh, my hands have done this. I planted the field out back and the corn grew and we had the harvest and it's because of my labor and my efforts that we have these blessings. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, I'm not sure that I agree with some of the things that have been mentioned as far as, uh, you know, what Arthur mentioned and what you mentioned regarding you cannot be thankful unless you, unless you come from hardship. Now, I know that nobody said that specifically but I think it was implied. Um, the, the, that, that would, to me, would abrogate 
asking God for blessings and then rejoicing when you do receive blessings. And, and if, if you can't thank God and honor God when you have blessings, that doesn't make logical sense to ask for them and rejoice, rejoice in them when you receive them. I, th con I think the problem is, is that people, uh, as we pointed out in the scripture, have forgotten God. I think you can rejoice to and thank God in whatsoever state you find yourself. That you don't have to start from a, uh, a situation where you're poverty stricken and hungry and poor, et cetera. I, that that doesn't have to be the starting point of every of learning the lesson and and putting thanksgiving in your life the the problem i see is, is as i've already mentioned is is that forgetting god and not being in the approach in our lives of thanking god daily yeah, I'm hoping we didn't give the impression that, you know, that, that Art and I were of the opinion that you, unless you've been in poverty, unless you have, have been in a serious trial, you're, you're not going to be thankful. That I don't think that was intention. I think Art specifically mentioned that his observations is that those that have gone through hardship and have gone through privation, have struggled through hard times, are more appreciative of, of, of things. that we're, we're a little bit more sensitive, I guess, to the blessings that we have. Um, you know, and, and, you know, you're right, Mark. I mean, I, obviously you can give thanks even when you're prosperous and give th God thanks for the blessing. But I think overall, like people that uh, forget God, as you mentioned, I think that's key also. People that, that forget God, that rely on themselves or rely on government or rely on the stores or whatever it is, that they, they become an unthankful people. And then as a result of that, they don't appreciate what they have. They take everything for granted. And of course, as you watch our decline go off the cliff and the shelves become empty, um, you know, I think a lot of people are going to be, I think your kids are going to appreciate what, what Jill has done because Jill has, has taught them a, a life skill that my, grand, my grandfather used to do that I've never really had to mess around with. And that is reusing all my aluminum foil. Um, I never had to do that because you use aluminum foil, you throw it away when you're done with Thanksgiving because you just get a new roll of aluminum foil at the store. Well, what happens as we become North Korea that there's no more aluminum foil at the store, the shelves are bare, you know, because of, of one problem or transportation or they can't get magnesium to make aluminum anymore. So there's no aluminum anymore. So we, t we start we having to reuse and these are our skill sets that we have because I think it stems from the concept of being grateful and thankful for what we have because we do acknowledge God. Yeah, Art, go ahead. Yeah, um, I think the, the thing is that we have lost a sense of history. Um, and I'd like to recommend a book, A World Lit Only by Fire, by William Manchester. Uh, and it goes through this period of time of the 15th, 16th, 17th century uh, uh, what the world was like, what people suffered, and the crushing of people, the common people, by very, very few at the top. People were put to death at the drop of a hat, literally. Um, uh, you know, by the hundreds, people who fled from England to Geneva, uh, Queen Mary put to, get to death 300 plus people. Henry VIII, a similar number. Uh, Queen Elizabeth I, fewer, but, but it, all it took was, you're a heretic, you're dead. So we, we cannot appreciate um, emotionally, if you will, some of these things that people go through. But I think it's critical to, uh, as Jill was saying, to pass on to our children, and Mark was saying as well, uh, but to pass on uh, an attitude of gratitude, of thankfulness, and not saying, well, you've got it so well, you, well, it was so hard when I was young, I was barefooted and blind and had bread and butter for breakfast, lunch and dinner, uh, kind of mentality. Uh, but, but to appreciate the wonderful blessings we have and value them. 
uh, we just accept, uh, our society just accepts, and uh, the history that we read is, oh, let's say from the founding fathers or, or the civil war or whatever, but not going back to the biblical basis, which really matches the dust for, in the 15th and 16th century there, where really things were hard and tough. And I highly recommend the book, William Manchester, A World Lit Only by Fire, The Medieval Mind and the Renaissance. I encourage you all to get the book and read it. It'll open your eyes. I appreciate that, Art. Thanks. So I'll have to look at being a history nut. That's something I'll get into. I, I'm less um, wise or, or scholar in, in medieval history as I am, you know, uh, American history. That's just seemed to be where my passion was lied, but has, has been. But uh, looking at uh, middle medieval, medieval history, oh, that's something I'll look into a little bit more because, you know, what's interesting is that you see the world way, uh, the way it's going, and it better authors than me have made note that the world's kind of regressing into the way it was in the Middle Ages of nobles and serfs, and that's kind of where Satan wants things, you know, between the the nobles and the rulers and the monarchy. And then the rabble that everyone else lives uh, on top of and takes advantage of. And that's kind of Satan's way. Again, I saw that in, in India. That's why the caste system exists there. That's what it does. And uh, watching us kind of regress from a constitutional republic into a, a nobles and serfs cl uh, class system, you know, that the world's reverting back to what uh, has existed for, for the better part of 6,000 years of recorded human history. So, um, but again, uh, one other, again, I'm, we're in the middle of the scriptures here. Um, it's important, again, to acknowledge, continually acknowledge God and give him thanks because I think it sets our attitude in the right frame. Again, Psalm 69, 30, and we'll praise God's name in uh, song and glorify him with thanksgiving. Um, I think these are all uh, important things that uh, we don't get complacent. We recognize by um, having a relationship with God and we don't forget God and where our blessings come from. And I, I think these are things that help us in terms of our heart and our relationship because we're dependent upon God uh, when we have this mindset. And that way, I think that um, inoculates us from becoming dependent on other men or other institutions of men or governments. Uh, because we're dependent on God and not dependent on, on other men for what we need. Um, uh, Apostle Paul, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, says for us to give thanks in every circumstance. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You know, uh, even in the midst of trials um, that we may go through, to give God thanks for that. Because there may be lessons that we're going to learn that we wouldn't learn any other way that's going to develop our spiritual character it's hard to, to, you know, to see that when we're going through a trial. It's like a spanking. You know, nobody wants to be spanked. No one wants to go through it. I think Skip gave a, 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 um, a message on the topic of spanking, or someone did recently. Uh, I was at the feast, actually. It was uh, Danny Jack, uh, Danny Jacques, I'm sorry. His, his sermon was about a national spanking. Um, and, you know, it, it, we don't recognize that there's a bigger lesson in store. When we go through trials that God allows them, and he permits everything to happen. All things work together for good called to those called according to his purpose so that we can we can develop the spiritual character that God wants us to have. And that does require us to have an intimate relationship with with him. And I think having a, a grateful heart and, and being dependent upon him for our, our provisions helps, I think, maintain that relationship so we don't start relying on our own hands or other men for things. And then those things become be, uh, you know, become gods. And it's always important to remember God and not forget God, because as Patrick Henry himself said, it's when the people forget God, the tyrants forge their chains. Something to keep in mind. Well, anyway, that's that's what I have as far as uh, the presentation on uh, Thanksgiving. Anyone have any other comments regarding Thanksgiving or anything that I've, I've talked about in terms of history? Um, now's the time to talk about it. But what I have written and put together, that, that concludes what I have for, for us today. Michael, that was awesome. Um, I, I learned, you know, a whole lot about the history of, of Thanksgiving. Uh, I appreciate it. Good job. Oh, you're welcome. Well, it's, it's interesting how, um, you know, when we think back to how people uh, retained knowledge of, of the scripture and, and things like the Exodus and 
the laws that were given and all that stuff before they had access to paper and books and things. The instruction in the scripture was was always to talk about it, you know, in Deuteronomy where they're instructed to talk about it when you, you know, when you lie down and when you stand up, and when you walk in the way and when your children ask, why do we do these things? Um, there was instruction there in in how to go about keeping the knowledge alive and um you know part of a little group i'm on they were talking about thanksgiving and and one of the guys was saying how you know they had a tradition where um it, you could bang your cup your silverware on your drinking glass you know ding ding and then you could uh express whatever it was that you were thankful for for the past year and uh, and it was their kind of family tradition and any time during the meal you could ding your glass and and speak up about something that you were thankful for and uh, and it just made me realize how how we don't do so much of that in our thanksgiving celebrations and that you know it, it's it lands at the feet of the parents if you don't if you don't institute those traditions and you don't encourage that uh, exchange of information and knowledge, um, then all this information that you've just given us, I'd say there are very few pe young people that could give you, the, you know, some information about the stories um, that led to Thanksgiving. And they're really, you know, it's only when you keep it alive that that truth survives. And we've seen that in so many things where, you know, um, you can either fail to speak the truth or you can speak lies and either one end up with a dearth of knowledge and no true uh, understanding of, of truth. And, uh, but it, these days we, we live in a culture and a society where people just don't seem to want to sit down and, and have discussions and and you know if what if what you have to say at the dinner table or whatever takes longer than 15 or 20 seconds i mean you've lost people you know there's uh it, yeah. i mean i'm not advocating for letting the food get cold because right. that's a really important thing at my house the food has to be hot yeah food. but <laughs> but you know that that just that general constant conversation is is what keeps that knowledge going. And we've, in too many ways, we we fail to take the opportunities when they do arise um, to speak to things that are godly and truthful and, and of historical value. So that's all. Yeah, you know, you're, you're right. I mean, there's been article after article in the last you know, decade or so that I've run across of major media publications or even on, on cable talking about how to deal with, uh, how to avoid your family for Thanksgiving. Stay home, don't go home. Or if you have to go home, uh, how to indoctrinate or lecture your uncle who's a conservative and, and get him to see the light of, of wokeness or whatever it is, or how to ostracize people. And, uh, you know, and, and it, it Thanksgiving, you know, even on sitcoms and that, it, it's there's a negative connotation that's been preached by our media that, you know, family is, you don't want to be with the family, you know, not on a day like this, you know, and um, again, as I mentioned growing up, I mean, Thanksgiving was less about going around the table and dinging the, the bell and talking about what you were thankful for. It was all about the food and then the football game that was on, um, you know, and then later afterward, it was making your Christmas list because that, and that's when I was a kid, we're talking 50 years ago. So the the path to where we've arrived in the country to where now, we're on the verge of having a proclamation by the president declaring it a day of mourning, like he did for uh, Columbus Day. It's now Indigenous Peoples Day. I mean, I think next year there may not be a Thanksgiving. And we're getting rid of it. Um, and why not? Because why give thanks to, to God, um, you know, when we've thrown him out of society? And let's not give thanks to the hard work that our, our patriarchs that established the country put through because those were evil white supremacists that committed genocide. You know, I think the thing that's amazing for me when going through this and thinking back on it, you had 102 passengers on the Mayflower. Almost half of them died that 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 first voyage. 
you know, when they got here. I mean, to me, wouldn't it not be so uh, uh, somewhat melancholy to actually want to have a Thanksgiving celebration when your wife and your children or, you know, half the people you came with are, are dead? Uh, and yet within a few months of their, you know, arrival after Squano taught them how to do what they did, they were exceedingly glad to rejoice. They weren't mourning the loss of those that risked what it took to come here and, 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 and uh, establish a beachhead colony that ended up becoming the, uh, the engine for what became not only our economy, but the, the, the national character, that Puritan culture that existed, that ended up becoming the foundational soil that birthed the whole notion of independence from the crown so we could have liberty as a Christian people. And I think that's one thing that, you know, because of the way history is not taught, even since I was in school, that we tend to forget that the, the Puritan pilgrims that came here came here for the purpose of establishing a more perfect uh, uh, way of life, a Christian way of life, a, a community of, of faithful believers that were not influenced by the corruption uh, of the churches in Europe so that we become a, a, a church in the wilderness. And it was a way of life for them. And they endured an incredible amount of uh, incredible amount of hardship that set the foundations that we've been eaten the blessings of ever since. And if you don't remind yourself of these blessings, then you forget. Again, why do we keep the, 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 the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread? And why does God have his annual holy days every year? It's for the express purpose of reminding ourselves what the history was. You know, that's why he tells the, the, uh, the Israelites and the Hebrews, you know, you will do this every year. Remember that you were once a slave in Egypt and I brought you out with a mighty hand. And, of course, we understand the spiritual uh, allegories regarding, uh, you know, unleavened bread and what it means coming out of sin. But we have to remind ourselves on a regular basis or we tend to forget. And when we don't and we when we are not thankful, when we rely on ourselves or get wrapped up in secularism, then all that stuff, as Jill mentioned, I think tends to go by the wayside. And we are where we are as a, as a culture and society as a result of all of that. So. Well, anyway, uh, thanks for the uh, the Irish iron sharpening, folks. I really appreciate it today. Anyone else have any thoughts on Thanksgiving? You know, uh, if and I, and I maybe I do this too much, but you know, when we talk about this stuff and so many things that we do talk about, it, it throws me back to the to the comparison of of what went on in, in ancient Israel, particularly what went on in Judah. Um, you know, they, they watched what happened to their el to their brethren up in the north and went on and did this, this, the same stuff and they, they forgot about God and they started worshiping other things. And I look at this country and, and I, and I see a parallel. That, that that's exactly what we have done as, as a country. Um, we have not just atheists, but we ha we have <clears throat> people that that worship the the uh, Eastern religion. You know, they're Buddhists and and so on. And uh, we we have as a nation are in the process of forgetting God and. Not being thankful is a, is a big part of that, and you know we're we're not we're not thankful. And I you know I I see all the memes and uh it, you know about uh, uh oh you know we've we, we want God to bless us, but we've kicked him out of school and we've kicked him out of this and we've kicked him out of that. And and I, I and I see uh, as do you all. I'm not telling you all anything you don't know. Uh, the same stuff that that happened to ancient Israel is and and Judah is going to happen, you know, going to happen to us. A um, couple of things uh, on that thought, Skip. Hold your thought because I want to tie into what you just said about you know other other gods and and uh, the Israelites. Uh, reminded me, I just had a, a great discussion with my sister, and she was bringing up that in the schools up in Chicago, what they're doing now is uh, they're 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 for, they're forcibly teaching all the kids in the schools, grade school and high school uh, up there because parents are complaining about it, not just critical race theory, but they're introducing these kids to the Indian gods. That's what they were covering, I guess, in the last few weeks. And she was saying, you know, 
she, she's like, I think that when, you know, uh, the founders came here, they drove out the Indian gods of, of earth and sky, the great spirit and all these pagan, you know, the, the gods of birds and kind of like the Egyptians. And that it was these gods were driven out of the land by a Christian people that God was giving this land to. We've talked about that kind of in the past, that there's parallels, as you mentioned, Skip, with ancient Israel. And now because we've forgotten God, it's like we're now we're reinviting those gods that were driven out of the land back into the land. And uh, and that was something that my sister was lamenting about. And, of course, it just adds to all the wokeness and all the confusion that's going on out there. And it, it just it, it, it's kind of sad. But, yes, I see what exactly what you're saying as far as the parallels of we're doing exactly what Judah did. And we're now going to worship foreign gods and, and accept them when uh, we know what the results are going to be. And we're doing it anyway. Anyway, sorry to interrupt, Skip. I just that thought. Oh, no, that, that was fine. I was I was kind of going my, my next subjects are kind of going away from the study. So let's hang. I'll hang on to them. Does anybody else have anything they want to add in the study or Thanksgiving or whatever? Because there I, I have some things I need to talk about a little bit. Okay, I'd like to make a quote. Those who do not learn the lessons of history are bound to repeat them. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that's the, oh, is that Burke or Voltaire? Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember off the top. Is that Edmund Burke? No, that's when good men do nothing. I think it was Voltaire. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, one, one of the two. Um, but, you know, based on what we talked about, gods being driven out of the land and, and doing what the ancient Israelites did in, in worshiping the uh, the gods that God said don't follow, uh, reminds me of all the things that we've been learning from Mark about the uh, principalities and the powers, uh, the, 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 the divine council, the spiritual entities that hold territories. And now we're, as a people, inviting the, these gods that have been driven out back in and it it's very disconcerting, and it does grieve my heart now that I kind of understand these things a little bit more than I did before, uh, especially seeing what we're doing as, as a culture. Like I said, when I was talking to my sister about that now they're teaching in school, the introducing kids to the pagan gods that, you know, we never paid, you know, any mind to before. So uh, very disconcerting. So we got to hold on to our faith in, 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 in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, despite what the rest of the culture does around us. So... Anyway, Skip, go ahead. Here's all you. You know, a couple couple of weeks ago, uh, when when we were talking about all the, or I was, uh, you know, that we were talking about the all the bad stuff that happened to ancient Israel, and it's happened to, you know, beginning to happen to this country and so on. And Mark asked a, a very uh, a very wise question: What do we do about it? You know, uh, and, and you know, and we talked about that. Uh, for, for a little while, but this is one of the ways that we combat it: is we're, we 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 must stay thankful, um, and and this is a part of of the hanging on. You know, we need we need to to, to hang on. I think Paul talked about that. You know, hang on to the truth that, that you know that you want. See, but well, who's he talking to? The Galatians there. You know, he was surprised that they uh, were so soon removed from and and so on. But. Uh, this has really been good. As a matter of fact, Michael, I'm going to give your phone number to everybody in my family, <laughs> the immediate family, uh, because next year at Thanksgiving, I'm going to take a part of what you went through today and give them a little history lesson uh, of some of the things that I learned. And one of the things that we're going to do, and Diana, I want you to help me to remember this. I want to put five kernels of corn in everybody's plate before uh, before we get started. I think that was a, you know, I, I thought that is so neat that the, you know, what a generation later or whatever they they put the five kernels to remind them of of what they had gone through and what how much how little they had. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. Go ahead. I mean, it blows my mind to think that they were literally each person was living before that 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 final harvest on five kernels of corn. That that's all the India stores that were left because all the food in the Mayflower was gone. And we talk about they were starving. Um, and uh, so yeah, and that's a good you know that's a good tradition reminder. Um, you know, hey, listen, don't don't take all these 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 turkeys and deer meat and you know all these pies and things we're enjoying. You know, this this is where this is. 
this is where we were. We were close to dying out. And so this, the, I think that's a good reminder. That does help, I think, in, in my understanding. That helps the, thank, the, the thankfulness department um, in a way. Because, you know, people that have, you know, that have never known, you know, want or hardship. And I'm thinking of my own children. Again, this is my own thing because I see a lot of ingratitude and, and uh, assumptions that we're just going to go to the store and get what we need and things are going to be the same next year that they were this year and abundance is going to get, keep keep going on and they've never known actually none of us have ever known what it's like to do without that are on the none of us have ever gone through a famine nationwide where the entire country has no food anywhere because there's been drought or a combination of government things we've never had that on these shores and yet you know it seems like we're entering in that season where uh, that may very well happen how are we going to react to that um, so yeah, the five kernels of corn reminds you, hey, here's here's where this is how close we came to going out. Yeah, Jim. Well, you know, in terms of being thankful, you know, in my family, uh, the Thanksgivings I remember, uh, you know, were mostly gatherings at my grandparents' farm. And so there's a little bit of the harvest stuff associated with it, not not really directly, but, you know, just because we were out there at the farm. And, you know, with probably only, only 40 people or so, all of my, all of my cousins and their parents and so on. But, excuse me just a second. Uh, my my parents lived through the Great Depression with two different, well, slightly different perspectives. Uh, mom's dad was a farmer, so food was never an issue for her during the Depression. But for... Uh, and Jill reminded me of this. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, mom never threw anything away. But when she was a kid, uh, her dresses would be made out of flower sacks. You know, they'd buy flour and the flour to have maybe a gingham print on it or something like that. And uh, they'd make clothes out of it. Uh, dad, on the other hand, they didn't have a farm and if it weren't for hunting and fishing, they wouldn't have survived. Um, and, you know, and we have so much, um, I don't know, maybe one of the lessons for kids is to take them camping. Yeah. That, that you know, uh. Let's catch something, have to actually gut it, you know, catch a fish and, you know, don't take it, don't take enough food for three, three day camp. Uh, you know, if you know that the, if you fish hard enough, you can get at least one or two meals of fish, you know, actually have to struggle to do it. Um, uh, we had a cottage up in northern Wisconsin uh, that dad built without any power tools uh, because we didn't have electricity in there. And, uh, you know, and I remember before the, well, he did have one power tool. It had a gasoline cement mixer for a little bit of foundation stuff. But, um, uh, You know, I, I remember sitting out there on the land where the cottage was built as a kid with my mother around, uh, my mother and my brother around a, uh, you know, around a fire and, you know, cooking hot dogs or whatever. Dad had gone out fishing and, uh, and he, and he left his pistol there with mom who, 
would hardly ever touch touch a gun and it, just in case a bear came and then of course we heard noises in the woods so that had to be bears so that was kind of frightful but you know actually having to go and get your meal and prepare it i mean you know it, you know, like I say, dad, dad would not have survived if if he and his father couldn't have uh, didn't hunt and fish. And you know, that's that's not that long ago. And everything we read about in the Bible is an agrarian society, which is you know, even when they were wealthy, they were poor by our standards. Yeah, that's that, that's the thing. And of course, you know, you see it today in in, in the culture, uh, with you know, and, and, and I'm talking about in general. I mean, there's always individual exceptions to the rule here. Mark constantly reminds reminds me of that because I tend to make sweeping generalities, but I'm speaking in terms of you know stuff that we we see happen around us from the media. And there's always isolated pockets where people are not this way. But I mean, you you have, you know, people take so much for granted. You know, just you know, look at all the riots that we had last year. I mean, you had, you know, people burning down their grocery stores and, you know, and, and they don't know how they don't know how to go out and hunt or fish or do any of the things you talked about, Jim. And yet they assume that they'll, they'll just build another store and they'll, they'll just truck the food in or you know, Amazon will ship us the, uh, the food. And, and, and the further we get away from from our dependence on, on God. In our dependence upon the land, that we're relying on the institutions of men, uh, the institutions of government, or the institutions of a of a working civil society. I mean, we we don't at least I, you know people forget the, how fragile a civilization is in comparison to the you know raw human nature. And I think as as we're watching things take shape out there in the culture, we're beginning to realize, or some people are realizing. Uh, how fragile the, the the how thin the veneer of civilization really is, and it, it it's a sad travesty. But again, as, as Skip mentioned, I mean, not the first rodeo. I mean, ancient Israel went through this. Judah watched what happened to ancient Israel, saw what was going to happen to them as far as consequences, and they went ahead and kept doing it anyway. And they ended up suffering the same fate. And uh, and I think that we're in the same boat. Uh, we have enough history, both. Uh, biblical and uh, historical that we can rely on to see where things go with the people that are not grateful and thankful to where their uh, blessings have come from, where that all ends up. And uh, and still, we're, we're doubling down on stupid as a culture and a society. And it's, again, it boils down to, I forget who said it today, is because the people had forgotten God. I think Mark did. And that's very true. And And as we've forgotten God, then we're not thankful. We become unholy. We become what Second Timothy three describes as the wicked generation. And that's not to say that there's people. You know, we're not wicked. I mean, well, I'm wicked. Uh, but I mean, in general, those of us that have a relationship with God, we're we're striving to overcome the wickedness. But now we have wickedness being institutionalized and being embraced as a neo religion, and uh, that's that's never that never bodes well uh, for people of God uh, because it. Those types of things don't tolerate any any kind of competition. Well, anyway, well, I appreciate everybody sharing their thoughts about uh, Thanksgiving and being thankful, and allowing me to go through our history. Um, because I think you know, even you know, as, as you were talking, Jim, I think remembering when we gather together for Thanksgiving, remembering the hard times that our our, our forebears, our 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 grandparents, our great grandparents, going all the way back to the pilgrims that came here, what they went through. I think it, it helps us to remember that we need to be thankful because we haven't had to go through those things that they went through. We're still living off the fat, uh, the blessings that have been established because of all the hard work that came before us. And of course, God's hand was central in, in all of it. So 